Far too many Palestinians have been killed. Far too many have suffered these past weeks. The words of US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. But who looks after those who are still alive in the middle of the Israel-Hamas war zone? My guest this week is Juliet Toomer, who speaks for UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees. So far, more than 100 of their personnel have been killed in the Gaza conflict. What we're seeing in Gaza right now is unprecedented on a number of levels. So how long can the agency go on functioning? How long can ordinary people suffer the intense bombardment, the acute shortages of basic goods, the lack of medical care? How do the people of Gaza live today when they have no idea if they'll die tomorrow? Juliet Tuma, welcome to Conflict Zone. Good to have you. Thanks for having me, uh, Tim. Thanks for having me. A week ago, Israel's ambassador to the UN denied that there was any kind of humanitarian crisis in Gaza. What would you say to him? Look, uh, way before this war in Gaza started on the 7th of October, the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip has been very, very dire. I mean, only at UNRWA, we were providing food assistance to 1.2 million people. The levels of poverty were among the highest in the region. So were the levels of unemployment. And then Gaza, let's not forget, um, was under blockade. So access in and out of the Gaza Strip was very, very difficult. Now, where we are right now is a humanitarian situation was made far, far worse due to a very tight siege and a brutal war because of the bombardment and the strikes um, that have been going on for five weeks now. So a humanitarian situation was made far worse. We are witnessing a humanitarian tragedy in Gaza made far worse every day this war goes on. How much faith can you put in official statements, either from Israel or from Hamas? What I do know are facts on the ground. What we do have at UNRWA is nearly 800,000 people who were forced to flee their homes. They are now taking shelter in more than 150 UNRWA facilities. This is more than four times what we had planned for under a worst case scenario. The situation in these shelters is absolutely, absolutely terrible because they are overcrowded and also because UNRWA does not have the supplies or the fuel uh, to reach people in need. So their situation is terrible and they are under bombardment and Gaza, the whole of Gaza has been under siege for five weeks now. We do not have the ability to respond to this volume, this huge volume of humanitarian needs in the Gaza Strip, also because we are not getting the supplies that we need and we're not getting the fuel. Well, I want to come on to that a, a, a little later, but can you believe the casualty figures coming from the Hamas-run authority in Gaza? The figure I'm, I'm thinking of is over 11,000 people dead in the war so far. Can you believe these figures? I tell you what, when we look at the casualty figures among our teams, among the UNRWA teams, we can confirm that 102 colleagues of ours have been killed in this war. This is the highest number of UN aid workers ever killed anywhere in the world since the establishment of the United Nations. And when we apply the proportionality of this 102 to the 13,000 colleagues that work with us, and when we look at the data coming from the Gaza Ministry of Health and apply a similar ratio, the numbers do tally. Now, yesterday we had globally around the world, the United Nations and entities around the world, we lowered the flag to half mast in recognition to the service of these colleagues that were killed. The only place we kept the UN flag flying high was Gaza, and it was a symbolic gesture on UNRWA's side to show commitment to the people that we serve, especially those 800,000 people 
who came to our shelters to seek protection and safety under the very same flag. The personnel working for UNRWA who were killed, they must have known the dangers that faced them, the risks they were running. What kind of people will put their lives on the line like that for other people? You see, UNRWA has 13,000 uh, employees working with us on the ground in the Gaza Strip. Until the war started, we were present across the Gaza Strip, north, middle areas, southern areas. And these were mainly teachers. Um, the vast majority of our teams on the ground are teachers who teach in UNRWA schools, which we sadly had to close. This deprived more than 300,000 boys and girls in Gaza from education for the past five weeks. And we had to turn many of our schools into shelters to take in people who sought protection and safety under the UN flag. These were people who were the, the, the colleagues skilled, I mean. They were mainly teachers, school principals, doctors, nurses, engineers, support staff, which is the backbone uh, of, of our operation. And many, some were many killed with their families, weren't they? Most of them were killed. You're absolutely right, Tim. Most of them were killed with their families. Um, we have horrific stories. One colleague of ours, Samir, was killed in his own home with his wife and eight children. Another colleague of ours, Serene, who was a gynecologist, she was killed with her daughter while she was at, at home. One third of our colleagues who were killed were not killed in the north. One third of our colleagues who were killed were in fact killed in the middle areas and in the southern areas. Where so, it's supposed to be safe. Where the Israelis said they weren't going to bomb. Because nowhere is safe, Tim, in Gaza. Nowhere. Not the north, not Gaza City, not the middle areas, and not the south. And in fact, when we look at the data, more than 60 UN facilities, under our facilities specifically, the vast majority of which are shelters where people are sheltering, 60 of those facilities have been hit. More than 10 of those have been directly hit. And 70% of the facilities that were impacted during this war in Gaza, the UNRWA facility, 70% were in the middle areas and in the southern areas, 70%. Do you reach a stage where you simply have to pull out because the danger to your staff is so great? I asked because one of your colleagues said the other day, every day you think it is the worst day and then the next day comes and it's even worse. Is that your experience? They're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. It's not every day. It's not only every day. I think every hour the situation gets worse and worse. The fluidity of, of this war is astonishing. Things continue to change. Things continue to move at a very, very fast pace. People continue to leave their homes. There is forced displacement happening in Gaza. There is collective punishment happening in Gaza. UNRWA is committed to stay in Gaza and to deliver to the people who need us most. And we will continue to do this, but we need many things for us to, to do this. We need supplies coming into Gaza on a regular basis. We need to expand the number of trucks that are coming into Gaza. We need to expand that humanitarian operation, both in terms of the volume and the frequency and the predictability of that humanitarian operation. We also need fuel. It's really, really critical that UNRWA gets fuel for humanitarian purposes. We have not received fuel for the past five weeks. We have been pleading to get shipments of fuel. And to date, we have not received any fuel. And fuel we need for our, the fleet of the cars, for us to be able to go pick up the supplies that are coming from the borders, for us to give to medical facilities, our own included, for the water pumps to work in our shelters, we need fuel and we have not received any fuel. Gaza has not received a liter of fuel since the war began on the 7th of October. For obvious reasons, there's a particular focus on the plight of hospitals in Gaza. The Red Cross said they'd reached what they called the point of no return. 
and that the lives of thousands of people were at risk. This is a, a daily, even hourly emergency, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. To get what, what, what medicine you can, what little medicine is left, to get what little fuel there is, to get what little drinking water there is. Um, how long can this go on for before, before people get ill from malnutrition, before there's illnesses associated with lack of sanitation? Uh, how long before that happens? Look, civilian facilities, including hospitals, but also UN facilities have not been spared. And these facilities, civilian facilities, schools, hospitals, clinics, shelters, UN premises and compounds, they are all protected under international humanitarian law, and they have not been. So rules of the war, they have been broken in the Gaza Strip. The Israelis say that the reason they are surrounding Al-Shifa Hospital, which I think is the largest hospital in, in Gaza at the moment, is because they're sure that there's a command and control center belonging to Hamas underneath the hospital itself. Do you know anything about that? I tell you what we do know. Shifa Hospital is the largest medical facility and the largest hospital in the Gaza Strip and one of the oldest Palestinian health institutions. It has been established in 1946. And in addition to it being this medical facility, a very important and critical medical facility, since the war began, Shifa Hospital has been hosting tens of thousands, according to reports that we get, tens of thousands of people in its courtyards and in, in its parking lot. So it's also being used as a shelter. Now, we at UNRWA have been able to access Shifa Hospital only once and deliver medical supplies, basic medical supplies and medicine throughout the war. We were allowed only once to do this very urgent humanitarian delivery that we did with the World Health Organization. And this shows you the immense challenges that we are facing in terms of access, not only from outside of Gaza to bring in supplies, but also within Gaza to move from the south into the north where there is Gaza City, where it has been the beating heart of the Gaza Strip for many, many decades. But there has been some evidence in the past that Hamas did hide weapons and tunnels under hospitals, hasn't there? Last year, your agency said it had identified what it called a man-made cavity underneath the grounds of a school in Gaza. It protested to the Hamas authorities and you sealed the cavity permanently. How did Hamas respond to your discovery? So what UNRWA does every quarter, Tim, is that we have inspection teams that go to all our facilities in the Gaza Strip and everywhere in the region where UNRWA operates. And we do this inspection against um, the humanitarian principle and for neutrality. And in fact, the last inspection we have done was just before the war, on the 30th of September, we do this every quarter, 30th of September, we have completed the inspection of all our facilities in the Gaza Strip. November 13th, the Israeli army showed pictures of guns, suicide vests, grenades, explosives, in what they said was the basement of Rantisi Children's Hospital. Does that surprise you then, given what you've just told me about the inspections you, you uh, conducted? I saw these um, reports, Tim, and UNRWA is not at all in a position to confirm or deny these reports. The Rantisi Hospital is not an UNRWA facility. And let me emphasize that civilian infrastructure, wherever they are in the world, not only in the Gaza Strip, civilian infrastructure must never be used for military purposes. Are you satisfied it isn't being used in Gaza? I really do not know that, uh, Tim. I really do not know that. You've been in other war zones. You've been in Iraq. You've been in Yemen. What stands out about this one from your, the experiences you've had to date? Well, I spent most of my humanitarian service working on one of the most brutal wars in recent history, and that is the war in Syria, where I worked in and out of Syria on the Syria war for more than a decade. 
And I thought that I have seen the worst during that war because I started working on the war in Syria in 2012 when the war had just started. And I saw horrors and I was, I witnessed terrible things happening, including to children because I was working for UNICEF back, back then. And I worked in different roles uh, with other entities in the UN. So I... I'm very familiar with the war in Syria, and I was very familiar with what wars do to lives of human beings. Well, let but, me ask you about that, because, because in your experience, what happens to people who go through this kind of trauma? What, what can we expect to happen to the people of Gaza? Do they ever recover? What we're seeing in Gaza right now is unprecedented on a number of levels. The siege is unprecedented. The level of damage to the civilian infrastructure, including to UN facilities, is unprecedented. The number of casualties is very, very high. The number of colleagues that were killed who work for UNRWA is very, very high. In fact, it's the highest ever since the UN started working towards the mid-1940s. The challenges that we are facing as the largest humanitarian provider in the Gaza Strip are unprecedented. It's unprecedented on all levels. The shock and the trauma that this is causing to people, including our own colleagues, is huge. These are scars that are going to be very, very hard to heal. And there are many, many people in the Gaza Strip who are either reliving the trauma of 1948 or they are now living the traumas of their ancestors and their fathers and their mothers due to this forced displacement and the resemblance of the exodus of what's happening right now to the Nakba in 1948, also known as the catastrophe. Winter is here. Do you have any idea what will happen to the hundreds of thousands of people who are now homeless? And, and in, the, in the longer term, are there any models that could suggest how long people might have to deal with this homelessness, with these shortages, with all the problems that affect their daily life? Winter, rain and the cold is going to make a tragic situation for people in Gaza far, far worse. Because what we have had until recently is in our shelters is women and girls sleeping inside classrooms and men and boys sleeping outside in the open. So with winter, it's going to get worse. And we are, of course, worried about the diseases, the spread of diseases, the lack of heat, the flooding uh, with the civil service breaking down, how is this going to be managed? It's going to be even bigger of a chaos than we have right now. So this is why it's absolutely critical that there is a humanitarian ceasefire, which we've been calling for for weeks on end now. Sadly, it's falling on deaf ears. It has to happen for the sake of civilians, wherever they are, including those in Gaza. You've just got back recently from an Arab summit in the Saudi capital, Riyadh. Reports suggested there was plenty of anger and invective, but I suppose anger is cheap. Who amongst the Arab leaders promised any concrete help at all for the Palestinians in Gaza? So for us at UNRWA, it was a historic moment because it was the first time in the history of the agency, and we're almost 75 years old, that we are invited at the level of our Commissioner General to brief and to address the heads of states, both of the Arab world and the Muslim world. So for us, it was important that we relay the message on behalf of the two million Palestinians who are trapped in this war. So that was one thing that we wanted to relay. And in terms of the reception, we got funding for our operations from Oman and from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and we got pledges from the UAE. We are still not certain, Tim, if we are, as an agency, going to be able to pay salaries for the staff, 
not this month, November, or not December, including those unsigned heroes that are working with the agency on the front lines in the Gaza Strip. The head of your agency said the other day there was a feeling among Gazans that they had been sacrificed and abandoned by the outside world. How widespread is that feeling among the people that you've met and you've talked to? Very widespread, very widespread. It's among our staff and it's also among the friends that we have in Gaza. And there is a feeling of abandonment and there is a feeling of um, not feeling equal, that the suffering and the, the carnage that is happening in Gaza is not important. Um, and that is changing, which is very, very good. I think more and more and more people around the world are understanding that civilians are going through hell in Gaza and that they are going through a collective punishment that so many people have been killed, including, according to reports, more than 4,000 children, which is, according to Save the Children, the highest number of children killed in any conflict since 2019. These children have nothing to do with this conflict or with this war, and no child should have witnessed what the children of Gaza have witnessed. Have Palestinians that, that you've met talked to you about the atrocities that Hamas committed against Israel? Yes, what, they what have. Do they say, what do they say about that? Yes, they have. And UNRWA and the Secretary General of the United Nations have condemned in the strongest terms the massacre that happened in Israel on the 7th of October. Juliet Tuma, what will you take away from all this? How do you... How do you process what you've seen? How hard is that for you personally? For me, it's a um, determination to continue to be the voice of the Palestinian people in Gaza, the civilians who are caught up in this war, and also to continue to work with our colleagues, with our teams on the ground, who are, by the way, and it's not a gimmick that, that I'm using, they are a rare ray of light coming out of the darkness of what Gaza has become. It's my duty to continue to support them so that they continue to be able to deliver to people who need them most, so that we continue as the largest UN agency to support and deliver the people that we are committed to deliver to. And these are the Palestinian communities in Gaza and elsewhere in this region. The head of your agency, says that since October the 7th, Gaza has gone from open air prison to graveyard. If he's right, what kind of Gaza do you think will be left? Okay, it is hard to answer this question while you have an active conflict going. What we do know from destruction, from footage that we've seen of destruction, including around our own office, which was in Gaza City since we started working more than 70 years ago, by the way, is the place looks like it's just been hit by an earthquake, except we have to remind ourselves that this is all man-made. And it's going to take probably years and years to rebuild. But the concern right now is not for the brick and stone. The huge concern right now is for the people and what they are going through and the mass displacement and the ongoing exodus and the forced displacement and the collective punishment. That's really the biggest, biggest concern that the agency I work with has. Your director said a new generation of aggrieved Palestinians are likely to come out of the bombing of Gaza and are likely to continue the cycle of violence. Do you share that view? What I do know from other conflicts is that violence breeds more violence and violence will never, never, ever get us anywhere good. And what we do know is the more violence continues, the more the war continues, the farther we are from peace and stability in this region. This is exactly why we call for a humanitarian ceasefire. And why do you think it's falling on deaf ears? That's not a question to me, Tim. 
It's not a question to me. You know the region, you talk to the players. I don't know. All I know is that the longer this goes on, the more we're losing on our humanity. It's for the sake of humanity. It's a point of make or break for each and every one of us about our humanity. Do we regain it or do we just let it slip? Juliet Tuma, thanks very much for being on Conflict Zone. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate your time. Thank you.